morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service for Sunday, February 28th, 2021, the second Sunday in the season of Lent. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our call to worship this morning will be done by Thomas. We are not the first to make the journey to Jerusalem. Many have gone before us and many will come after us. From near and far, God's people gathered to celebrate God's goodness on the holy mountain. We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. Jesus often went to Jerusalem as a child to celebrate Passover. Now he has set the, his face towards Jerusalem again, knowing this time will be different. We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem is somber. He has no illusions about what is to come. Still, he goes ahead doing God's will. We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. Let us worship God. Let's join together in our opening hymn, Holy, 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 number 299. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of light, we want to follow in Jesus' footsteps, but we have our fears and doubts. We'd rather avoid the pain and the darkness on our journey. Give us courage and perseverance when the journey is difficult and the grace to help others on the road. 
We ask this in Jesus' name, and we sing together his words. Hear the good news of the gospel that is shared with us. God has given us the gift of new life and a fresh beginning, not for this moment, but for our entire lives. This is an incredible gift given to us, and it is the good news, it is the gospel. In Christ, life has begun anew right here, right now, in this moment. Thanks be to God for that gift. Amen. Good morning. This morning's psalm is Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Good morning, welcome to Children's Time. This morning I have two very big celebrations to share, um, and that's that Alan turned 90 this last week, and Gwen had a special birthday as well. Uh, so I'd like to celebrate both of their birthdays, and those are big, uh, big important birthdays. And so in honor of that, uh, our choir would like to sing happy birthday to Alan and happy birthday to Gwen. And then I'm gonna go off and change into some more formal clothes. I'm feeling a bit too casual today. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. I have something to show you this morning, and you may have seen it before. This is called the periodic table and uh, it's used in science, and this is made up in science of all the different elements uh, that make up our world. So all the things that make up everything you can see around you um, are included on this, this uh, periodic table of elements, except that this one is a bit different. This is the periodic table of black Canadian history. So a group of people at a school here in Ottawa got together and said, for Black History Month, we need to think about who are some great black Canadians that we can celebrate. And so they made up this table of a whole bunch of different black Canadians that we can celebrate. And they're color coded, whether they're uh, musicians or whether they're um, athletes or, or uh, scientists or so many different things, so many different ways that, 
that black people contribute to the whole society that we are. And so this is divided up. And if you look at each of them really closely, there's a little QR code in the bottom of it. Does anyone know what a QR code is? I suspect you probably do know. And what happens is if you look at that QR code and you use a smartphone on it, if you take your phone and you go to take a picture of it, on a smartphone it says open in the Canadian Encyclopedia. And when I open up in the Canadian Encyclopedia, it says to me, this person is Willie O'Ree. And who is Willie O'Ree? Well, it tells me that Willie O'Ree was the first black player in the NHL. And he played for the Boston Bruins for quite a long time. He was in the NHL for over 20 years. Uh, he played 45 games with the NHL. Um, he played his first game in 1958, I believe it was. And the, his number was number 22 with the Boston Bruins. And the Boston Bruins have said that in celebration of Willie O'Ree um, in 2022, they're going to retire his jersey. So no one else will be using that number 22 from then on in. Um, so Willie O'Ree is the very first uh, black person to play in the NHL, and he was a Canadian. And he was born in New Brunswick and grew up here in Canada. Um, so that's just one of the people that we celebrate as we celebrate Black History Month, as we think about uh, all the incredible people um, who contribute to our world and to our society, and uh, scientists and mathematicians and, and uh, athletes and so many different people. And so we celebrate uh, for Black History Month, um, Willie O'Ree, the first black uh, NHL player who came from Canada. If you go onto our website, you're going to find a link to this periodic table, and you'll be able to click on the different, um, different elements, the different people, and find out more about them if you're interested in that. And maybe we'll have it set up at the church here sometime too, so you can even go in and use a phone and find out more about these people. Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for our country. Thank you for Black History Month and helping us to learn more about black people and their history in our country, the challenging things and the great celebrations. Help us to listen, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go now in peace. And the New Testament reading comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain, apart, by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Jesus walked the mountain
Let's join together in our next hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 376. Once again, let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. This is Transfiguration Sunday. It's, it's the Sunday where we see Jesus in a different light, if you were. And so do his three disciples, Peter, James, and John. But how do we understand this passage that we've just heard Pam read? How do we make sense of this account of, of Jesus and his friends up on that mountaintop? Jesus' clothes changing to dazzling white. The appearance of Moses, the one who had led the Israelites out of slavery, and Elijah, the great prophet who taught God's people about God, both of whom had been dead for a good long time, but they appeared to Jesus and to Jesus' friends on the mountaintop. How do we understand this passage? The story is so far removed from our experience that it's almost impossible for us to relate to it. Setting aside our concerns about the rift and the space-time continuum that seems to be happening here, why were Moses and Elijah there with Jesus in this story? Jesus has gone up this mountain to pray. This passage comes right after Peter has declared Jesus to be the Messiah. And Jesus has told the disciples that that being this Messiah means suffering and death for him. Jesus at this point knows that his ministry is shifting away from teaching and healing and miracles and towards Jerusalem, his journey towards Jerusalem and eventually his death. In a sense, the whole of the season of Lent that we celebrate is, is this journey that Jesus takes towards Jerusalem. We don't know for sure why Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, 
but I, they, I believe that they were there to reassure Jesus and to help to prepare Jesus for what was about to come next for him. And also to remind him that even though he was going to be going through difficult times, that God would be present with him and God would support him through those times, that God was going to take care of him. Even though this passage is difficult for us to understand and relate to, one thing this passage does do is it, it inspires us to imagine. Imagine what Moses and Elijah and Jesus talked about on that mountain. Imagine what Jesus' concerns were at this point in his ministry as he was shifting towards Jerusalem. This is one way that we can enter into this passage. If you could speak to any person from history, someone who could reassure you about your own future or, or simply give you insight and guide, or guidance for today, who would that person be? What would you ask that person if you could talk to anyone from history? Would it be a great figure from history that you'd want to talk to? Or a family member? Or a parent? Or grandparent? Or great-grandparent? Or, or a spouse that you miss? If you could speak to anyone from the past, who would that person be? And what would you want to ask that person? I once wrote a paper for a course I was taking in my undergraduate degree for uh, so psychology of religion was the course. And the paper I wrote was kind of based on this idea, if you could talk to someone from the past. In the paper, I had a conversation between me and Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud. The premise was that I was traveling through Switzerland, and when I was hiking in the mountains, I came across this cabin. And when I went into the cabin, I discovered Jung and Freud sitting by the fire, having a beer together. I sat down and shared a beer with them and asked them all kinds of questions about their work, their perspective on God and religion, and then I sat back and watched them talk and argue with each other. If I could go back in time, I would love to have a chat with Freud and Jung. And if I still had that paper today and I could read it again, I suspect I would learn a fair bit about my 20-something self. Even more than speaking to one individual, though, Jesus' experience on the mountaintop was one where he had the opportunity to speak to more than one person, and I think that would be fascinating, too. I would love to be part of a dinner conversation between the four reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox. Imagine sitting and sharing a meal with them and what they would talk about. Or can you imagine going for a walk in the woods on a summer evening with Jesus and the Buddha and Muhammad? Imagine that conversation. What people or person from the past would you like to have a conversation with? Coming back to Jesus on the mountaintop, what was special about Moses and Elijah and Jesus was that they all represented closeness in relationship to God. Moses guided God's people out of slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. And while doing that, he gave them the gift of the law, the Ten Commandments. That law was a gift because it showed them that what God wanted them to do and also how to relate to each other as God's children. Moses was the mediator, the conduit between God and God's people. Elijah was also a conduit between God and God's people as well. As a prophet, he represented that special communication that God wanted to share with them. Words of challenge, words of warning, words of judgment sometimes, but also words of comfort and consolation at other times. And always, God's word for God's people. And so we have the law and we have the prophets, then what does Jesus represent? All three of the figures were transfigured, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. They all changed. They all became dazzlingly white in their robes. So what does Jesus represent? Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. I think Jesus represents God's love and how God will continue to reach out to us and guide us and nurture us and take us into the future. If you could talk to someone from history, who would that be? And maybe the situation could be less a matter of, of what questions would you ask that person, 
But what would that person want to say to us today, in our time, at this specific point in history? I think there are a couple of reasons why this is on my mind right now. I am fascinated by the idea of time travel. And we're currently watching a TV show called Being Erica, which features her going back in time to, to meet with people from her past and, and to see how she could change her life. But I'm also thinking right now about Martin Luther King Jr. and about his life and his ministry and all that he did. In particular, I've recently been reading a letter that he wrote called Letter from the Birmingham Jail. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote that letter when he was in the Birmingham Jail for a nonviolent protest in Birmingham, Alabama. In response to ongoing racial segregation in the South and racist attitudes in general. As I think about our world today, including racial injustice in Canada, and I think about what I can do in my time right now, I look back and I like to think that I would be standing with Martin Luther King Jr., standing right beside him in those protests long ago. And then I think of Edward Ramsage. Edward Ramsage was one of the eight clergy, Roman Catholic, Jewish, Anglican, and Presbyterian who co-wrote a letter denouncing the protests that local black leaders had arranged to bring an end to racial segregation in the South and in Birmingham in particular, and these protests that Martin Luther King Jr. had become involved in. Edward Ramsage was the minister at First Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and he signed that letter. These white clergy, these eight white clergy, advocated patience and seeking unity and following the rule of law. And the police, who were sworn to uphold the rule of law, were beating nonviolent black protesters like Martin Luther King Jr. in the streets. What first drew my attention to this letter was that the eight white church leaders wrote this letter and called it a call for unity. We hear a lot about unity today. It's a term that's thrown around by some when they disagree the direction that things are going. And it's often used as a, an attempt to stop change. Can we not just have unity on this issue? This letter, a call for unity, was really <clears throat> a call to stop the protests and just to be patient and just to wait while the courts gradually sorted through desegregation. The letter, a call for unity, resulted in a brilliant response from Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail. He had to write this entire letter on the side of a, a newspaper that he had. You'll find a copy of the letter, Call for Unity, that Martin Luther King Jr. responded to on our church website, and you'll also find Martin Luther King Jr.'s entire letter from Birmingham jail there. I invite you to read them in their entirety. In response to this call for unity, and just to be patient a little bit longer, Martin Luther King Jr. in part responded by saying, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at a horse and buggy pace towards the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it's easy for those who've never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, and when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as you ex try to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that's just been advertised on television, and see the tears welling up in her eyes when she's told that Fun Town is closed to colored children, and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness towards white people. 
when you have, conco have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking in agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do we white people treat colored people so mean? Then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over. The men are no longer willing to plun be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Just wait. Just wait a little longer. I'm sure it'll work out. What does all of this have to do with our reading this morning? Our reading made me wonder again what Martin Luther King Jr. would say to us in 2021. I come to back, back to him partly because he was an activist, but also because he was an ordained minister with a PhD in theology. What would he want to say to us today? To me as a minister, a minister of the Church of Jesus Christ, to the body of Christ that is in this world, to the whole society. Thankfully, we do have some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s words. And these words reminded me again of Jesus on the mountaintop with Moses and Elijah. You know, the night before Martin Luther King Jr. died, he spoke at a gathering of, of sanitation workers in Memphis. He did not have a prepared speech. In fact, he wasn't even planning on going that night because he wasn't feeling well. But when he heard that over 3,000 people had gathered and, and he needed to be there, he went anyway with no speech prepared. But he could always speak. His words began with, and you know, if I were standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general or panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight back to Egypt and I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through or rather across the Red Sea, through the wilderness on toward the promised land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus and I would see Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Euripides and Aristophanes assembling around the Parthenon. And I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discussed the eternal issues of reality. But I would not stop there. Martin Luther King Jr. goes on in this speech to talk about all the great civilizations of the world and learning from those people and learning from those experiences of the past. And he went on at the end of each of these little vignettes saying, but I wouldn't stop there. I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now that's a strange time statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around. But that's a strange statement. But I know, somehow, that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century and in that way, through men, in a strange way, they are responding. It seems to me that Martin Luther King, King Jr., on the night before he was killed, was gifted with a vision of the future based on lessons from the past. He was having his own mountaintop experience and he was another conduit another channel between God and us, communicating with this world. He fought his whole life for civil rights, for equal rights, but not just for black people, not just to end segregation, also to fight poverty for all of God's children. If I could speak to someone from the past on a mountaintop, I think I'd like to speak with Martin Luther King Jr. But I don't think... I would ask any questions. I hope and I pray that I would just listen to what he has to say about our world and about what we need to do next. 
you know, on Jesus' mountaintop. I don't believe that Moses and Elijah did just show up for Jesus to ask them questions and find out more about the past, as interesting as that would be. I don't think that's why Moses and Elijah were there. I believe they were there to tell Jesus about his future. And Jesus chose to take his friends Peter, James, and John to be with him as well. What would Martin Luther King Jr. tell us about our world today? What would he say about our future? I would imagine he would tell us about his dream of equal rights for all, rooted in the good news of the gospel of Jesus. I'd imagine he would challenge me as a preacher not to retreat into theological and philosophical thoughts or to seek unity or to seek an easy path over justice and inclusion, but to preach equality and justice for all of God's children, rooted in the good news of the gospel that Jesus taught. I'd imagine he would call all of us to look around for those in need and to use our privilege and our position in this world to stand up with and to speak alongside those in need with powerful words rooted in the good news of the gospel that Jesus taught. Martin Luther King Jr. ended his speech to those Memphis, Tennessee sanitation workers on April 3rd, 1968 with, with these prophetic words not knowing what his tomorrow was going to bring. We hear these words today, not knowing what our tomorrow will bring either. Well, I don't know what will happen now, he said. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. At supper time the next day, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by a gunman as he was preparing to go to a friend's house for a nice home-cooked meal. And I hear the echoes of his last speech, where he took the audience through the history of the world to all the great civilizations of the past, and he repeated these words, but I wouldn't stop there. And he didn't. His speeches, his teachings, and his work continues on, rooted in the good news of the gospel that Jesus taught. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. God of ages and God of the here and now, hear our prayers. In your wisdom, you've given us a sense of the past and the present, and yet your ways in our world remain unfathomable. You've given us dreams for the future, and yet the future remains at a distance for us. In the present, we pray for your guidance and for your wisdom. Hear the prayers of a grateful people. Help us, O God, not to take for granted your gifts. The gifts of love and life within family and among friends. Gifts in the whole creation and in the gathering of your people. Gifts we celebrate in ways we can put into words and in ways that go well beyond words. Fill us with a sense of your presence each and every day in our lives, O God, and a desire to enjoy fully each and every day you give to us, not living just in the past or in the future, but in the present, right now, and in your presence. We pray today as well for all of your children, for those in need all over the world, for those who live every day with racism and limited opportunities, 
and fear that so many of us will never fully understand. For those who are ill and those who are going through treatments, for those who are frustrated with our slow pace in a COVID-19 world, we also thank you, O oh God. We thank you for signs of hope, for people who care for others, who speak up for those in need, who live in the boldness of your calling and exist every day, rooted in the good news of the gospel that Jesus taught. In these moments of silence, we speak to you and we also listen to you. Hear our prayers. Let's join together in our closing hymn, Lord of Light, number 769.
If you could talk to anyone from history or any group of people from history, who would that be? What questions would you want to ask? And what, they, what would they tell us today about our world and what they see in our world? God is with us right here, right now. Jesus is with us right here, right now. Moses and Elijah walk with us as well into the future that we have. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us this day and every day. Go now in peace.